Let us pray. Holy words of our faith, handed down to the sage, came to us through sacrifice, O oh, heed the faithful words of Christ. Holy words long preserved for our walk in this world, they resound with God's own heart, O oh, let the ancient words impart. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, indeed we are truly grateful for your ancient words. A word that has life, a word that provides restoration, a word that brings renewal in the mind and soul of your children. So we bow before you in this moment, O oh God, thanking you for your word and I pray, O oh God, that you let your ancient word impart as your word is about to be proclaimed to our hearts this morning. We give thanks, Almighty God, for the faith with which we will receive this word and the obedience, O oh God, we will have in our hearts to embrace it and to make the decision to live our lives according to this word. Now I pray you bless the words of my mouth and the reflection of our hearts together, for you are our work, our strength, and the God of our salvation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace and the peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Lord be with you all, brothers and sisters. Today we gather on this Remembrance Sunday and we are reminded of the profound courage and the sacrifice of those who fought for peace, often at great personal cost. Some of them would have lost their lives or even wounded um, terribly. The legacy calls you and I today to examine our own commitment to peace. And one powerful story that captures my attention on the essence of a courageous peacemaking is the story of a man called Telemachus, a Christian monk who lived in the fourth century. The story says that one day, Telemachus decided to go for a visit to Rome. So he put his possession in a sack and set out for home, for Rome. And when he arrived in the city, people were assembling in the streets. So he asked what all the excitement was about. And there he was told that this is the day the gladiators would be fighting and killing each other in the Coliseum. At once, he ran to the Coliseum and heard the gladiator saying, Hail Caesar, we die for Caesar. There he thought, this is not right. He jumped over the railing and went, in, and went out into the middle of the field, got between the two gladiators, held up his hand and said, in the name of Christ, forbear. The crowd protested and began to shout, run him through. A gladiator came over with his sword, hit him in his stomach and um, um, hit him in his stomach with the back of his sword uh, that sent him collapsing in the sand. He got up and ran back again and said, in the name of Christ, forbear. The crowd continued to shunt, one him over. One gladiator came forward and plunged his sword through hit the little monk's stomach and he fell in the sand which began to turn crimson from his blood. But one last time, the man grasped out in the name of Christ, forbear. 
a hush came over the 80,000 people in the Coliseum. Soon, a man stood and left, then another and more. And within minutes, all the 80,000 had emptied out the arena. And this courageous act ultimately influenced the end of gladi gladiatorial games in Rome. A powerful reminder, brothers and sisters, of the impact one person can make in the name of a peace. And so, as we remember those who served and sacrificed in the cause of peace for our nations today, this story brings us face to face to Jesus' word in Matthew chapter 5 and in verse 9 where we read, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. This text is the first of Matthew's five discourses in the gospel. And it is known to us Christians as the Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount. It is also recorded in Luke chapter 6, verse 17 and verses 20 to 23 as the Sermon on the Plain. It comes after the beginning of the public ministry of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 to 17, where he calls the people um, to repentance. And the call to the first disciples in Matthew 4, 18 to, 21, to 22, to follow him. Now, in this chapter, Jesus outlines in his teaching both the qualities and the character of those who will be part of the kingdom. For he is proclaiming that the kingdom of heaven has come near and challenges people to be part of that kingdom. I believe that today there is a dire need for Christians to embrace this principle in their lives. For we live in a society and world that is characterized by violence, conflict, aggression, and war. Certainly, brothers and sisters, there is a need for peace and the peacemakers in our world. And therefore, as we journey through this passage this morning, I want to explore with us three key questions. Question number one, I want us to explore what does peace mean? And uh, secondly, I want us to explore what does it take to be a peacemaker? And finally, what blessing awaits those who choose uh, this challenging path of being peacemakers? Firstly, what does peace mean? Perhaps the best way to deal with this question is by beginning with the mis um, looking at the misconception about peace. And here I am referring to peace from the biblical and not the social or cultural perspective. So I want us to understand from the very beginning that peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is not the avoidance of strife. Neither is peace the accommodation of issues or simply the absence of war. Biblical peace is much more than that. The Hebrew word for peace is shalom. It was a common Jewish greeting. In the same way today we would say hello, good morning, good evening. But it was much more than that. Shalom in the Jewish culture expressed the desire that the one greeted will receive all righteousness and goodness that God the Father can give. All righteousness and goodness that God the Father um, can give. In fact, that is, that is God's highest good for you. It, it speaks of well-being, it speaks of wholeness and completeness, it speaks of prosperity and the harmony with God, with others, and also with our creation. In the New Testament, 
The word peace is translated by Irene, and the same idea is also conveyed. Therefore, beloved, peace is a blessing and a manifestation of divine grace. It is one of the gifts of God's Spirit, as listed in the Bible in Galatians 5, verse 22, and bound up in the notion of perfection. That is why Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount concludes with this challenge, be perfect therefore as your heavenly Father is perfect. Shalom then beloved, does not just stop violence around us, but it restores relationships, it promotes justice and creates unity. So every year on Remembrance Sunday, we remember that the peace we as nations enjoy today is built on the sacrifices of those who stood up against oppression and evil in our world. They fought for more than just silence. They fought for justice, for freedom, and also well-being. A vision that closely resembles God's shalom. But we must ask ourselves, do we understand the truly peace in this way? Do we truly understand this word peace in this way today? Are we willing to pursue this deep whole peace in our own lives and communities even when it costs us everything? I say this, beloved, because true peace demands that we face difficult truths. It asks you and I to look honestly at our own hearts and ask if we are agents of reconciliation or sources of division. Do we carry grudges, fuel conflicts, or stand in silence while others around us suffer? Shalom then calls us to go beyond comfort beyond tolerance and move toward a radical Christ-like love that seeks the best for others. This vision of peace, my friends, is challenging because it requires humility, forgiveness, and selflessness. And these are all virtues that go against our natural instinct. Yet, this is the peace that Christ, our Savior, offers. The peace he embodied when he died on the cross and the peace he calls you and I, all of us, the church, the body of Christ, to pursue. So that is peace. But moreover, I want us to explore what does it, what does it take to be a peacemaker? What, what does it, pay? It, it takes to be a peacemaker? Do we go to bed and wake up tomorrow and say, I think I am a peacemaker? Or we just got up and say, you know what? Because I go to church, I think I am a peacemaker. In the text, it is obvious that Jesus calls us to be peacemakers and not just peace lovers or peace enjoyers. Some of us, we love peace, we enjoy peace. But peacemakers here, Jesus says, they are those who bring peace to others because they have, they have it in themselves. But I believe that a person who lives with unresolved conflicts on their hearts cannot bring peace to others. You cannot be a peacemaker and then you are someone who, you know, who live uh, day after day with unresolved issues in your heart, and then, uh, um, uh, you know, so, so you cannot bring peace because whatever you have inside of you, when you're bound up to people, it will spill out. And so therefore, I want us to consider three essential characteristics of a true peacemaker. The first characteristic I want us to look at is purity of heart. Peacemakers act from a pure heart. 
They are motivated by a genuine desire to see God's goodness flourish. Too often, beloved, we can fall into the trap of performing peace. It's beautiful to perform peace. We, we, we may smile, we, we avoid confrontation, and um, outwardly we display harmony. And yet inside we harbor resentment, pride, and selfish motives. Purity of heart means that our desire for peace is sincere. Rooted in our love for God and our love for our neighbors, rather than in selfish or superficial motives. This means then, it means that we are to speak up against injustice even when it is or feels uncomfortable. We are to let go of grudges and seeking what is truly right, not just what is easy. Indeed, my friends, purity of heart challenges us to examine our motives and ask, are we willing to put aside our pride? Are we willing to sacrifice our comfort? And are we willing to forgive as God has forgiven us? Yes, peacemakers must be pure in heart. Heart meaning not physical, but what we truly are. That's the first characteristic of peacemakers, purity of heart. Another characteristic of peacemakers, I believe, is courage for justice or courage for righteousness. Peacemakers are not self-righteous, they are not. Rather, peacemakers seek and pursue righteousness. Righteousness here, beloved, has to do with sincerity and right relationships with God and with each other. Jesus, in talking about kingdom values, challenged his followers in these words in Matthew 5, 20. For I tell you, he says, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The problem with this group, beloved, is the fact that they were masked, they were hypocrites. They were those who act um, like an actor on a stage in a play, but it was not really who they truly are. But peacemakers cannot be people who were masked. They cannot be people who wear masks. They must be righteous. And, and so the word and the word that is used in the text for righteous refers to doing equality to all. Seek justice for all. It speaks of equity where the heart is right with God. In other words, true peacemakers, beloved, pursue justice as well as harmony. I understand that justice can be uncomfortable in some cases, for it demands that we stand up for the oppressed. It, challenge, um, it, 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 it demands that we challenge systems of unfairness and sometimes confront powerful forces. However, the courage to pursue justice is the hallmark of peacemaking, my friends. As the prophet Micah said in Micah 6 verse 8, what does the Lord require of you, of us, but to seek justice, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. So this characteristic will force us not to look away when others suffer, not to remain silent in the face of wrongdoing, but to actively seek to make things right, even if it means taking personal risk or facing opposition, that is who a peacemaker is. But the question is, brothers and sisters, are we willing to be courageous for the sake of justice? 
to challenge prejudice, to bridge division, and to step into difficult conversation, engage in difficult conversations. Are we willing to do that? Do we have the courage to do that? Jesus himself, the Prince of Peace, our Prince of Peace, was not afraid to confront injustice. The Bible says he overturned the table in the temple and rebuked deceitful leaders all in the pursuit of God's righteous peace. Are we, or do we have this characteristic in us where we possess that courage for what is right. Another characteristic I want um, to share with us, brothers and sisters, is forgiveness and humility. Peacemakers possess this characteristic, forgiveness and humility. Peacemakers, they know the value of forgiveness. If you are a peacemaker, you will know what it means to forgive. You will know how valuable it is to forgive. Forgiveness is often misunderstood as a feeling or as simply letting go. But truly, brothers and sisters, forgiveness is an act of the will. It is an act of the will. It is choosing to release the desire for revenge, to let go of bitterness, and to extend mercy even when it is undeserved. It's an act of the will. Peacemakers are people who can look past offenses. Persons who are humble enough to admit their own faults and are strong enough to forgive others, even when they themselves are hurting. Jesus taught us to forgive 70 times seven. An impossible standard without God's help. We cannot attain this level in our lives without the help of God. But one that is achievable, brothers and sisters, with the help of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. Yes, true peacemakers bring forgiveness, bring forgiveness into the relationship as well as their communities. The question, once again, that, need, that, that, is, that needs to be asking or to, to ask is this. Are we willing to forgive those who hurt us? Are we ready to let go of grudges? Are we willing to be humble and to seek reconciliation even when it is difficult? That's why our brother James reminds us in James 3.18, and a harvest of righteousness is always sown in peace for those who make peace. Yes, brothers and sisters, peacemakers are to be pure in heart, pursue justice and harmony, know and embrace the value of forgiveness. And by seeking to live lives by these standards, peacemakers will reconcile people to God and not pushing them away with their behaviors. Jesus called in the gospel was for persons to repent because the kingdom of God was near. And hence, by calling person into the kingdom who are reconciled to God, peacemakers who have become part of the kingdom seek to reconcile others to God as well. So, seek to pursue and seek to cultivate this characteristic in you if you are a child of God. Finally, I want us to look at what blessing awaits those who choose this challenging path of being peacemakers. In every one of the Beatitudes, my friend, Jesus pronounced a blessing. 
The poor in spirit are recipients of the kingdom of God. Those who mourn will receive comfort. The meek will inherit the earth. The merciful will receive mercy. The pure in heart will see God. However, the blessing for peacemakers is a very profound one. It comes as a new identity. Blessed are the peacemakers, Jesus says, for they will be called children of God. Very instructive. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. So it is not the devoted church goers. It is not the person who attends all the church's activities. It is not the person who can pray well or sing well or preach well. No. But the peacemaker um, or peacemakers are those who are um, um, children of God are those who are peacemakers. So the fact that you are attending church, the fact that you are a devoted church goers, the fact that you are in every activities, the fact activities, the fact that you can pray well, you can preach well, it does not make you a child of God. But according to Jesus, peacemakers are those who are called children of God. Those who actively and intentionally pursue the blessing of peace. It is my conviction, my experience, and my observation that you can be all these things and still be quarrelsome, divisive, troublemaker, and a person of strife. That's why sometimes people have difficulty believing that this brother or that sister or we are Christian because we are so, I mean, we are troublemakers. We are little fighters wherever we are. So you can be all of these and still be quarrelsome. That's why in this very teaching, Jesus warned in Matthew 7, 21, that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. So Jesus makes it clear that blessed is the peacemakers, for they will be, they shall be called children of God. Hence, to be called a child of God then is to be rec recognized as bearing God's nature. As someone who has the, the, DNA, the DNA of God in you and in us. So a peacemaker reflects the heart and the character of God, our ultimate peacemaker, who sent Jesus to reconcile us to himself. Jesus, our Prince of Peace, who endured the cross for the sake of peace, showed you and I the depth of God's love, that while we were still sinners, he died for us. But notice, beloved, that the blessing of being called the children of God is also a challenge. It is also a challenge. It is a challenge because I believe it challenges us to ask, do we reflect our Father's heart? Do I reflect my Father's heart, the God who created us, the God who lives in heaven, our heavenly Father? Do I reflect my Father's heart? Do we live as his representatives in the world? Do we bring peace and reconciliation wherever we go? It is a challenge, beloved. This title, Children of God, carries both privilege and responsibility. It's a privilege to be called children of God, but also God expects there is certain standards, way of life that God expects of us as being God's children. And as children of God, 
We are to be the light of this dark world. And we are to be messengers of God's peace. When people see us, they should see glimpses of God's peace and God's love. Because that's all that we are. But let's be clear, beloved, this is nothing easy. This is nothing easy. For it often calls us to take the first step towards reconciliation. Apologize when we are wrong. Forgive those who hurt us and seek unity over division. Yes, it calls you and I to a higher standard than the world's standards. One where we do not repay evil with evil, but overcome evil with good. And in a world that often rewards power, vengeance, and self-interest, being a child of God can feel countercultural and even radical. And this Remembrance Sunday then, as we honor those who laid down their lives in the pursuit of peace, let us sincerely ask ourselves, are we truly peacemakers? Are we living out God's shalom, God's peace? Are we standing for justice, forgiving those who hurt us, and reflecting the heart of God in all that we do? Remember that God is the author of peace. As the Apostle Paul reminds us in Romans 15, 33, that the God of peace will be with you all. So the challenge for us today, beloved, is a challenge to strive for peace with every single one that you encounter, every single person that you encounter. Therefore, as we honor the memory of those who fought for us today, let us commit ourselves to being peacemakers. Peacemakers in our own lives, in our families, in our workplaces, in our communities, in our congregations, and ultimately in our world. Then, with renewed conviction, let us join our brothers St. Francis of Assisi and pray, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. And where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. It is my prayer, brothers and sisters in the Lord, that the God of peace will give you and I, will give us the body of Christ, the courage and the conviction needed to live as true children of God, bringing God's peace into our world. For as Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. May God bless you, may God bless me, may God bless us uh, as we do so in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.